to another episode here on the Nature's Premier Week in Review. I am your host, Brooke Nichols, and I am beyond blessed to be back here with you all today. Thank you all so much for tuning in to another episode. Here on the Nature's Premier Week in Review, we highlight different news topics from conservation, sustainability issues, animal welfare, poaching, illegal logging. I mean, we talk about so many different things here on the show, but we are always looking to get tips, to get advice, to get feedback from our listeners. Feel free to email us at speaking at naturespremier.com or even leaving a comment in the comment section below. We absolutely love hearing from our listeners and it really does help us to take that information and make a better show for you all that we are doing here weekly. Please do subscribe and share this content so we can get the message out to more people who can really use this information. I mean, this is real news, you guys. This is what's happening from around the world and it affects all of us. Now onto the show. I have highlighted time and time again my issues with zoos all the time. I actually have to curb it a little bit, but I have highlighted it so many times. And this is another article that was released recently that just solidifies my detest and disgust for many different zoos around the world. Tug of War. This was an article posted by the sun.co.uk and it was actually posted within the last month. So only on the 20th, actually within the last week, right? Brit Zoo sparks outrage for letting children as young as eight in human versus beast challenge. Zookeepers claim the animals enjoy the activity and find it enriching. Earlier this month, Dartmoor Zoo launched the challenge, which is $15 a ticket, in which four people take on Big Cat in Battle of Strength. Zookeepers say the activity is enriching for the animals, providing them the best welfare possible, but not everyone agrees. Four members of the public aged eight and above stand holding a rope which feeds under a fence into the cat's enclosure. The other end of the rope holds a piece of meat which the lion or tiger holds onto, engaging in a game of tug of war with the participant, reports the Daily Star. Two animals take part in the activity at Dartmoor Zoo, Dragon, the male tiger, and Jassir, the male lion. An advertisement for the experience on the Plymouth-based Zoo's Facebook page features a video of a zoo worker engaging in a game of tug of war with one of its animals. It was posted with the message, this type of enrichment is very important to keep the cats fit and healthy, adding that it helps the big cats work for their food and build muscle mass. But the animal rights group, the Born Free Foundation, took issue with the new activity at the zoo. They tweeted, to offer human vs. beast experience this February half term. Is a tug of war game with a lion or tiger really the way to inspire respect for these animals? Please urge the zoo to rethink this. Don't buy captivity and keep wildlife in the wild. And honestly, I just, I couldn't agree more. Many activists replied to the treat expressing their disgust at the activity, calling the zoo shameful and medieval. Jenny Goldsmith wrote, shameful. How about baiting some of your bears whilst you're at it? You are supposed to be conserving the future of these animals, a position of responsibility, not exploiting and abusing them for profit. Absolutely disgraceful. While Paul replied, are they living in medieval times? Whoever thought of this and backed it should think carefully about demonizing animals as commodities for profit. Zookeeper Simon Moore said there are many zoos that do this kind of enrichment. We believe in giving visitors as much insight into the animals, needs, and natures as we can. It's a great privilege to experience this level of contact with the animals and we hope participants will feel that the small charge we are levying to aid our charity is a fair exchange. Now, my feedback and my thoughts on this is I really try to look at it from an objective point of view. Of course, I am biased. I am someone that is not a proponent of zoos anywhere. There's very few zoos that I agree with, really. I mean, there's very few zoos that I would support. But I will say that this is just an accident waiting to happen. Now, I don't know anything about the actual habitat itself, how it's set up, but I'm telling you, if the lion or the tiger gets its claws on one of those children that are into this exhibit, it's their game over, it's done, it's done. Like why endanger the lives of a human? Why endanger the lives of these animals? Just so you can make a little bit of coin and you know, put a social media post on Facebook. Like I just don't understand what they're looking to achieve. And I do understand that they, they want enrichment, they wanna do all this stuff, but I just don't know how playing tug of war with an animal that would rip your face off if it had the chance to is really going to give children an experience that's really going to have them leaving knowing anything more about the animal than when they walked in. It's just something that doesn't make a lot of sense to me and I would love if this zoo would let me know a little bit more about their educational process when they're doing these types of 
exhibits. Uh, obviously, it's to, you know, gain attention. It's to bring more people into their zoo, into their enclosure, because again, zoos are a business, so they want to make money. They want to make sure that these animals are working for them and, you know, promoting them, making them money. That's what they're supposed to be doing. That's the only reason why they're there. You know, and I think it's really just reckless that they would allow this type of situation to happen, in my personal opinion. Um, I think, you know, with the Born Free Foundation, I just thought, I just recently became aware of them and I really like the work that they're doing. And I have to say, I agree with them. You know, if you really want to have people learn more about animals in the wild, we need to keep them in the wild. We need to have serious boundaries and protection and very strict laws in order to let them live the life that they're meant to live without people coming and killing them. I mean, if that's what you really want to do, I just can't patron an establishment that would put its patrons in danger and the animals that are held captive there in danger because you know, again, when something happens, they always put the animal down. They do it. Unless you're SeaWorld and, for example, Tilikum, whose sperm was worth millions of dollars, killed m several different people there and they kept him alive. Like, no, 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 it's okay. We're not going to kill this one because he's very profitable, but we'll have him be in a bathtub size enclosure and then he'll just die miserably. Like, that, that'll be his punishment, right? And that's exactly what happened. So yeah, I, th I just don't think it's appropriate. I think it's a very bad idea and I think it's an accident and a tragedy waiting to happen. An article came out five days ago from CNN and it's about Yang Feng Glen. Queen of Ivory, jailed for 15 years in Tanzania. A Chinese woman nicknamed the Queen of Ivory and thought to be one of Africa's most notorious traffickers has been sentenced to 15 years in prison, Tanzania authorities told CNN. On Tuesday, a Tanzanian court found Yang Feng Glen, 70, guilty of smuggling 860 elephant tusks that authorities say were worth $6.45 million. Yang Feng Glen was sentenced along with her Tanzanian co-accused Salvius Francis Matembo and Maniz Philemon. They were also sentenced to an additional two years in prison under Tanzania's Wildlife Protection Act, which they can convert into a fine amounting to twice the value of the ivory they are charged with smuggling. Authorities put this value at $12.9 million. The defendants have already lodged an appeal, the court said. Tanzania's director of public prosecutions accused Yang of running a sophisticated supply chain between East Africa and China, using her ties to the Chinese and Tanzanian elite to move ivory across the world. Yang was arrested in Dar e Salaman, Tanzania's largest city, on September 28, 2015, after a year-long manhunt. After more than three years of uncertainty and delays in the case, conservation organizations say the sentence sends a strong message to traffickers. The government is taking wildlife trafficking very seriously, says Chrissy Clark, the executive director of PAMS Foundation, a nonprofit group that fights crime against wildlife and supported the Tanzanian task force that arrested Yang. Today's sentencing is a testament that nobody in Tanzania is above the law. The landmark ruling marks one of the harshest sentences ever handed down to such a high-profile and well-connected Chinese national living in East Africa. Tanzania investigators told CNN Glenn came to Tanzania in 1975 as a translator for a Chinese company that was building a railroad linking the port of Dar el Salaam to Zambia. She was one of the first Chinese people to learn fluent Swahili. According to an interview she gave to the China Daily newspaper in 2014, she quickly fell in love with the country. She even named her daughter Fei the Mandarin character of Africa. In 1998, she opened a restaurant in Dar e Salaam that had become popular with both the Chinese expat community and wealthy locals. Officials say she used the restaurant and other property as a front for illegal trade in ivories. Before her arrest, she was also served as a secretary general of the Tanzania China Africa Business Council. Tanzania, which some have called the ground zero of elephant poaching in the last decade, has been heavily criticized by conservation groups for its inability to stop the mass killing of its elephants. The East African nation lost 60% of its elephant population from 2009 to 2014, according to data released by the Tanzanian government. But local conservation groups say the election of Tanzanian President John Magufuli in 2015 boosted the fight against poaching. An attack on Tanzania's wildlife is seen as an attack on Tanzania.
said Clark. None of this would have been possible were it not for the political will of the president and his drive to stop wildlife crime and corruption. In the past, it has been rare to see poaching ring leaders arrested and convicted, but since the creation of an elite national multi-agency task force in the country, there has been a massive crackdown on poaching. In the past four years, several poaching rings have been dismantled and numerous lengthy 20 to 30 year prison sentences have been handed down to wildlife traffickers, according to the PAMS Foundation. China has long been one of the world's biggest markets for ivory, but in 2018, the Chinese government banned all trade in ivory and ivory products in the country. I will say that is such big news. 15 years, truthfully, is not enough in my personal opinion, especially when you are thinking about the fact that she probably will get out sooner, but it is putting a strong message out there to other traffickers that, you know, when you're caught, you will serve justice. Now, unfortunately, we do see time and time again that these people do get let off. You have the witnesses that get shaken up that don't want to have anything to do with the actual prosecution of these traffickers, probably, you know, truthfully out of fear for their life. But if more and more people are being penalized, if they are getting stiff fines, they are getting jail time, it is really going to deter people from wanting to traffic and kill these animals. I will say though, you know, you, you heard how much it costs. I mean, over six million, almost $7 million in ivory. We need to have some pretty comparable jail time with that, truthfully. I mean, 15 years is a lot. But, you know, I would say probably 30 years would be more more efficient. I have to say I am happy with the call, though, to arrest her and to prosecute her at least 15 years. I think that was a great call. Now, just to segue from one poaching account to another, I am seeing a trend, and I know a lot of other people are seeing a trend, at least for certain parts of the world, that they are taking poaching very seriously. In fact, Kenya just announced that there's a death penalty now for poachers. Kenya is home to a number of iconic animals, ranging from elephants to rhinoceros, to giraffes, to leopards and cheetahs. Elephants and rhinoceros are among the most threatened, as their tusks and horns make them prime target for poachers. It is illegal to kill the endangered animals in Kenya, and the Wildlife Conservation Act put in place in 2013 carries a life sentence or fine of $200,000 for offenders. However, according to Najib Balala, cabinet secretary in the Ministry of Tourism, this has not been the deterrence enough to curb poaching. As a result, a much harsher sentence has now been announced. Poachers in Kenya will face the death penalty. Large herbivores in Kenya continue to be killed by poachers. Poaching in Kenya has been on the decline due to increased attention to conservation and wildlife enforcement efforts. Compared to 2012 to 2013, rhino poaching in the area has declined by 85% and elephant poaching by 78% still the animals are in peril. So I do understand where some people stand with the death penalty. I certainly have my own personal views on the death penalty as well. I will say though, that's the kind of deterrent that I'm talking about. We really do need to have very strict penalties for these poachers. There are thousands and thousands of rings, hundreds of thousands probably of rings that are around the world that are just decimating these populations. They're absolutely destroying the planet. They're destroying our wildlife. They're destroying our rainforest. I mean, really like these are irresistible irreplaceable species. These are irreplaceable areas. We cannot get the rainforest back. I don't care if you grow 100 trees and cut down one of them. It's not the same equivalent. We cannot get that biodiversity back. So I do agree. I will say I have my own strong feelings about the death penalty, but I do agree that threatening the death penalty is really where we need to go with this. Now, we've talked about poaching before on the show, and there's a lot of gray areas with poaching. A lot of people don't realize that Poaching is such a dirty industry. It's really a dirty industry and it hurts the natives in the area. We've talked about this before where what happens is with these poaching laws, poaching laws need to be more fair, they need to be more strict, they need to be more transparent, and they can't just be for one sect group of people. So for example, there are people that could pay lawmakers in the area, let's say, uh, I'm not saying this is what happens in this area, but like, let's say Zimbabwe, for example, um, you know, they can go to Zimbabwe and they could pay off you know, these, these hunters can be like, listen, can you lift the ban on this type of animal or, or do something for this period of time? And they'll agree to terms. And then that will happen. The natives will think they're allowed to hunt these animals now. And then they won't realize that the ban had been put back in place. And the natives will be the one that are getting these strict penalties. So it's very, very important that, you know, it needs to be across the board. We need to stop the corruption because that's really where it's at. At the end of the day, it's the corruption. It's the people that have a lot of money. They have a lot of power. They have a lot of pull. And they're the ones 
ones that are getting away with murder, literally. And you have the natives who may need to survive, they may need to do, the, you know, just to live, and they're hunting, and they're the ones that are getting these penalties. And these scumbags who are probably hunting countless animals annually, you know, illegally, they're the ones that need to be held accountable. So we need more awareness on poaching, and I have had so many people say, why do you talk so much about poaching? Because it's such a dirty issue, and it literally is at the core of the decimation of our wildlife. It is completely destroying our environment. You know, because when, when one animal species is kicked off and another animal species is kicked off, that greatly affects our biodiversity. It affects our climate. It affects our wildlife. It affects our environment. You know, and people need to really be keen on this because it doesn't matter where you live, it's affecting you too. It's affecting you on some level and you have no idea until it's too late. You have no idea until one day you wake up and you're like, damn, I should have done something. Damn, I wish I would have shared that article. Damn, I would have wish I did this. I wish I would have done that. And hindsight's 2020, and this is why I talk about this on the show. So I wanted to segue real quick as one of the last topics of today's episode, and it's going to be about a post that I found very uplifting, and it's by the Washington Post, and it's titled, In a World Drowning in Trash, These Cities Have Slashed Waste by 80%. Now, this was a very important article for a few reasons. We all know we have a huge problem, especially here in the States, especially in New York, with having to ship our garbage to other states. Our landfills are inundated. We're constantly closing landfills. And we really do need to shift our focus from producing so much garbage to really a more zero waste lifestyle. And I found this article very uplifting and I'm going to share with it with you now. Little Kamikatsu was facing a big problem. The rural Japanese town of 1,500 residents didn't know what it was going to do with its trash. Residents had always burned it, first in front of their homes or on their farms, then in a large community pit, then in an incinerator the government quickly banned out of fears of pollutants. The town didn't have money for newer, safer incinerator. It had to find a new way. They had to look into zero waste, said Akira Sakano, chair of the board of directors of the Zero Waste Academy, an educational institution and in kamikatsu, explaining the discussions of those days in the early 2000s. That research introduced that town to what was then a virtual unknown, but has since grown into one of the most widespread and successful recycling efforts in history, bringing cities the world over to the precipice of what only seemed fantastical, the elimination of waste. Today, places in rural Japan to metropolitan Sweden send very little of their trash to the landfill. Many more, including the district, have a zero waste plan. In the United States, San Francisco leads the way, diverting more than 80% of its waste to and a half times more than the national average. It has become a lifestyle with millions of images flooding Instagram, touting a zero waste existence and generating businesses from around the world. The concept calls on people to think differently about waste. And that's a lot what we talk here about on the show. It starts with the creation of categories. There are recyclables like aluminum cans and glass bottles, reusables such as clothing, compulsibles such as uneaten food. And then there are those that shouldn't be used at all such as plastic bags, which are very difficult to recycle. The number of categories might expand or contract depending on the location, but the goal behind the zero waste philosophy is the same, to vastly reduce the amount of trash going into the landfill, diverting it, the parlance of waste experts, away from landfills and incinerators. Debbie Raphael, director of the San Francisco Department of the Environment, who oversees the city's zero waste initiative, said it's top down and bottom up. In San Francisco, there are three bins, one for recycling, one for compost, and one for the landfill. The categorization is left to residents and the sorting is left to the city contractor, Recology. It takes policy, Raphael said, of the zero waste philosophy, which has purportedly cut the waste, the city's waste in half. It takes financial incentives. It takes consequences for not participating. And it takes an ethic of a sense of responsibility for the health of our planet. It is a planet drowning in trash. Every year the world is making more of it. In 2016, the world cities produced more than 2 billion tons of solid waste. Americans produce a disproportionate amount, throwing away the equivalent of our own body weight every month. That is wild, I did not know that. And as the planet's population grows, the problems are poised to become significantly worse. Large landfills, according to a Washington Post project on trash, get as many as 10,000 tons of waste every day and are filling quickly. Within three decades, trash will outweigh fish in the ocean, according to the World Economic Forum. Absolutely disgusting. In a consumer society, waste is an accepted part of life. A strategy is needed to reverse this trend. There's still so many items that aren't recyclable in the waste stream, like used diapers, to finally do with all the waste. 
As a community, we can only do so much, Sakano said. The businesses need to change their product design. It is enough to be proud of slashing the waste total? Yes. We've already shown that we can do this, Sakano said. But is it enough to stop? Everyone needs to start, she said. Otherwise, we don't see the future. So I thought that was a really important article to share. You know, it's very true. We have to pressure these companies to make more sustainable solutions. We really, really have to do that. This reminded me a lot of what I do with Nature's Premier, you know, our diaper service. For a long time, we have been offering compostable diapers because we wanted to offer a more eco-friendly but not fully eco type of diaper to accommodate different people's situations and whatnot, but we are phasing it out. Honestly, if we're trying to move and promote more to a zero waste lifestyle, we really do need to either be all or nothing. And that is what we're doing. So for a long time, having worked with different companies and seeing what needs to be done, a lot more that's needed for diaper manufacturers to do in order for these diapers to actually break down. You know, there's a lot of people that really need to be made aware and it needs to be more more accessible to families about the severity of why we need to choose reusable diapers of why we need to this was a great article to read and i was really surprised by the amount of work that all these other areas are doing and i had no idea about i really had no idea about this area in japan that was viciously recycling everything that they could and it is very true what they say at the end you know businesses need to change their product models in order for it to be more recyclable right now just to segue real quick with what i do with nature's premiere our diaper service for the last 10 years, almost 10 years, you know, we started as cloth diapers and we know that cloth diapers are the true zero waste option for families, but we wanted to really cater to those families who just couldn't get the hang of cloth diapers for whatever reason. They didn't want to deal with it. They didn't want to use them. And we've been doing that for eight years, but now we're pulling back on the composting program. We are just going to go back to our roots of doing cloth diapers because it's either all or nothing. And until companies make a hundred percent compostable diaper, until these facilities can open up where people can compost their diapers for a way cheaper rate than what small businesses like Nature's Premier can charge. Uh, that's where change would really happen. You know, until they do that, people are still going to have to throw their diapers away. They're still going to have to deal with all the waste that's going into the landfills. And I thought it was really important to highlight this topic because zero waste really is, it all falls on us, right? It all falls with our habits, with our sustainability levels, with what we're trying to do with the environment, with the changes that we're trying to make, you know, and it's just so much more than, you know, using a reusable cup. There's so much that we have to do. And we posted on another video about really just taking it slow, you know, because in order for us to achieve like a 90 percent recycle rate that's all habit changing from a very large percent of the residents that reside in the area you know i can imagine new york like how much would it take for us to recycle 90 percent? i mean obviously that's like hard to even fathom but even if we were super diligent and we wanted to do that and everybody was was using reusable everything and only using some you know single use items the companies still have to step up and they have to change their game plan. They have to change their design plan. So I thought it was really important um, that they had highlighted that because there's really almost only so much that you can do. And that's why I always tell people, you know, like take it a step at a time, baby steps, you know, just start to really try to use more reusables and kind of stay away from the single use items, at least for now until companies can really shape up and be able to provide families and individuals with more sustainable products that they can use in their day-to-day -day lifestyle. Now, I do want to share the last topic of today's video and it is about Japan restarting commercial whaling hunting after 30 years. Um, I had posted this on our page and the Nature's Premier podcast page probably around when this article had come out. This came out at the end of December um, but I just wanted to talk about it because I actually didn't highlight it in any of our videos leading up to this video so I wanted to go ahead and do that for you guys today. Um, I'm going to read this article. It's by truththeory.com and it's a very upsetting situation. Uh, I will say that there's a lot that goes into this, but this just leads back into why we need to be aware of these situations, why we need to press our lawmakers to have more animal conservation rights, because it's absolutely devastating, you know, the fact that they're bringing whaling back after 30 years. It is such a problem. You know, some people think that we don't need whales. And this article, I like how it jumps into the fact that we do need whales. 
Just like the presence of large mammals such as elephants and rhinos shows the abundance of food and sustainability of current practices in land's ecosystems, the presence of large cetaceans ensures the health and prosperity of the world's oceans. Why? Because thanks to those deep divers, a lot of, of the surface, which thereby ensures the survival of plant plankton, the largest source of oxygen in the world. This also creates vertical currents of water, thereby regulating oceanic temperatures. Moreover, their skeletons are humongous and extremely rich in carbon, which, when they die, sinks to the bottom of the ocean, carrying a lot of carbon with it down there, away from the atmosphere. And like most niche apex predators, such as lions, sharks, and tigers, their survival helps the survival of prey, which would otherwise die of population explosion. See, that's another thing, too. I'm really happy that they highlighted that, because some people say, oh, who cares? Why, why, why do we need giraffes? You know? Like, it's a big problem, because everything's connected. There's a big ecosystem. There's an ecosystem with everything. One thing is connected to another, is connected to another, and it's all just a big circle. Their numbers have already been irretrievably low, with an estimate suggesting that whale numbers would reach half of the pre-whaling figure by 2100, despite conservation efforts. In the midst of all this, Japan, which was part of the International Whaling Commission, the main whaling prevention body, has decided to restart commercial whaling from January 2019. 50 years now, whaling has still been practiced by Japan, on the pretext of scientific research. Despite the IWC's banning of commercial whaling in 1986, Japan used scientific research as a cover story to sell the meat of whales like minke whales, consumption of which has been a tradition of the island country. After the announcement on Wednesday, many conservationists from many countries have threatened dire consequences. Japan, through its spokesperson, Yoshield Suga, has accused IWC of not fulfilling one of its initial goals, an example, sustainable commercial whaling instead. It is concentrating only on increasing the whale numbers, which is conservation. It has, however, said that it will restrict its hunting to territorial waters and economic zones and not go on its controversial Antarctic expedition. Ironically, despite the hike in consumption after World War II, because of easy availability and a shortage of other meats, whale meats now make up only 0.1% of Japan's meat consumption. Australia's Foreign and Environment Ministers Maurice Payne and Melissa Price have issued a joint statement stating that they were heavily disappointed. Greenpeace Japan cited that the government would face heavy criticism as G20 summit is going to be hosted in their country if it moved on with its decision. The current IWC ban had initially agreed to create a commercially viable and smaller catch quota which would let the numbers rise, but later it totally banned whaling. Japan had been masking commercial whaling as a scientific research for years under a special exception rule of the IWC. As a result, whaling nations like Norway, Iceland, and Japan have always cited their country's traditions while protesting said banned. Nowadays, despite most species being endangered almost beyond hope, like the mink, which is Japan's main target, has significantly thrived above the endangered quota thanks to IWC's ban. Japan will still be under scrutiny from many organizations like the UN, which has the Convention on the Law of the Sea. It can, however, join NAMCO, the North Atlantic Marine Mammal Commission, which was born when Iceland, Norway, Faroe Islands, and Greenland were being thwarted by the IWC again and again. Japan has, for the last 30 years, caught around 200 to 1,200 whales per year under the pretext of monitoring stocks and investigating which species have recovered from the endangered status. Even till September, in the IWC convention in Brazil, Japan tried to secure a quota for sustainable commercial whaling and also promised to set up a committee for the sustainable whaling for abundant whale stocks and species. Since the last thwarting, there has been talk of Japan leaving. The future is dark, my friends, especially because this move might give an incentive to other pro-whaling IWC members to just quit and hunt unless someone steps up to the plate. So it's very alarming when you see something like that, when they're like, you know what, screw it, kick the bucket, I'm leaving, we're gonna, we're gonna resume hunting. Because these inflated numbers, population numbers of these whales, you know, they give, like, false confidence, right? If you guys have ever seen the videos of whaling, it's absolutely atrocious. Like, it is absolutely atrocious. This news was really upsetting, and it was hard for me to segue it into, like, a, like a video, like a, a Nature's Premiere Week in Review, but it's something that has to be talked about, because the fact that these countries can just pull out of something like that, just pull out of it, be like, you know what, peace, we're out, like, I'm not dealing with this anymore, we're just gonna go back to whaling because it's our, you know, tradition, and same thing that you hear from, like, Canada and seals and all this other stuff, like, the, it's deplorable, it's absolutely deplorable, and like this article said, and I thought it was very well stated, you know, there's reasons why we need these animals, it's for so much more just to look at and to 
know they're there. It's for the ocean biodiversity. It's for the conservation. It's for the environment. It's for the ecology. And the fact that they can just go and resume hunting, like we need more checks and balances. This is why we have to put their hands to the fire. We have to put these hands to the fire. We have to tell these people that it is just not acceptable. We're not gonna have them poach our wildlife to extinction. We cannot do it because we're not getting them back. We're just not gonna get them back. You know, even, and that's what people say too, they're like, oh, we need zoos because, or we need aquariums, we need all these places because they're, they're not gonna be able to live in, in the open because of hunters and all this other stuff. But what do you think is gonna happen to the environment when we just put them into cages? When we just take them out and put them into cages? They're gonna feel the absence regardless. You know, they're not gonna be living and hunting prey and taking care of everything like they're they're supposed to be doing in the wild why they're here right it's all it's all the ecology of how the world works they're still gonna feel their presence same thing in the seas I'm surprised that these animals are even alive still with the fact that we are just that we're just polluting our oceans and they're like barely livable I mean it's disgusting it's really disgusting and this is a very sad article and I, ju I just wanted to talk about it though because I had just po I posted it a few times and I never really elaborated into it but that that's pretty much what's happening Japan's upset that they didn't get a chance to continue their whaling and you know they, they for scientific research you can't what do you need scientific research for for what for for what what are you doing that for how you set how are you selling whale meat for scientific research it just doesn't make sense and honestly there needs to be some kind of peace treaty with conservation efforts so we can all work together i understand people feel their traditions are being you know rejected thrown to the side cast away but at what point do we continue with traditions if it's going to destroy the biodiversity of our oceans? Like, wh like, where's the line to that, right? Like, where's the line? And how can they just so easily pull out and not get any repercussions? I mean, that, that those are really my questions. I'm not in politics, but it is something that's very alarming and I wish I would know more. I wish I could know more. So I am following this issue very closely and I will keep you guys updated when more information comes to light. Thank you all so much for tuning into this week's Nature's Premiere Week in Review. I really appreciate your patronage. Please do share this video so more people can get this information as a lot of this stuff is just not mainstream or mainstream enough. It really does help the show and it really does help get this info out to more people who can use it. My name is Brooke Nichols and I'm the host of the Nature's Premiere podcast and and week in review, and I hope you have a wonderful week ahead. Take care, friends.